Thank you, Chair, uh, and thank you all for attending today. Nice to see you again, Mr. Hare. It's uh, always a pleasure, and I mean that sincerely. Minister, the, um, I'll just read 11 points from my additional comments to the job insecurity inquiry uh, report. Um, these are the things that we see in addition to exploitation of casual coal miners, which we're going to have a further discussion about tomorrow. Yes, you and I, yes, yeah. we are. Yes, uh, and, and which we've been trying to make uh, progress <coughs> for, for a couple of years now. Um, in addition to the exploitation of casual coal miners, Australians are suffering right now from what I consider to be COVID mismanagement, both federal and state, due to capricious lockdowns and mandates. People are uncertain. The second thing is the phasing out of the coal industry and jobs under the, part, uh, under the policies of all four major parties. The erosion of people's rights and freedoms, especially workplace rights and freedoms in this context. Increasing energy prices, which are decimating manufacturing and hurting agriculture. The killing of manufacturing as a consequence. The lack of much needed tax reform. The lack of much needed economic reform. Increasing debt, workplace health and safety systems being bypassed. Australia's productive capacity being destroyed, and I'll, this is the one I want to talk, ask questions about, the failure of our industrial relations systems and more. There's a lot that, that's hanging over people's heads, workers' heads, yep. and small business in particular. Okay. Would you agree? And, and I think the solution in many cases is to come back to the basics of employer-employee relationship, the fundamental workplace relationship. So with regard to the coal miners, in Queensland and especially the Hunter Valley, we've seen uh, workplace safety and health jeopardised, bypassed, people threatened with firing, being fired if they raise safety issues. I uh, made a submission to the Grosvenor Mine Inquiry. The uh, issue of Simon Turner, no workers' compensation, no accident pay for injury, um, sacked while being injured, injuries and incidents not being reported, pay rates for casuals being 40% less than people on permanent employed by the mine owner, right next to them doing the same job and the same roster. Coal LSL, which I commend you for the report that's come down today. Thank you. And I think they're coming later on. To yeah, we'll be there. Be, yeah, no, that's what I thought. Yeah, you'll be asking the questions, yes. yes. Uh, as we have been in every session for the last two years. Um, the loss of coal miners' basic leave and, and other entitlements and the threats of dismissal. So these remain outstanding and still to be addressed. And we'll be talking more about that tomorrow. Yes. What I see, uh, Minister, uh, I'll let you finish. No, that. I'm just having a look at something that you'd written just to make sure I'm all over it. Yep. What, um, what, what my question is basically, the exploitation of casuals is, I believe, a symptom of a, com a highly complex, needlessly complex industrial relations situ uh, system that is not serving workers, not serving small business, and not serving some employees. And families and workers are getting jammed in the middle. We see large companies, multinationals in particular, using casuals to go bypass industrial relations situ uh, systems instead of sitting down and negotiating with their workers and with the union, we just see a bypassing through casuals. So I'm, what I'm asking you is, is, is there any understanding in your department that that the exploitation of casuals is a signal or a symptom of the fractures in the industrial relations system. Okay, that w there was a, a lot of commentary yes. there, but what I might do is hand over to Mr Hare, who obviously has looked at the job security yep. report, um, and get him to take that question. Um, thank you, Senator, for the question. In terms of the, um, the ca casuals, it's probably just worthwhile clarifying. So. Where casuals are employed by the company themselves, they are still subject to the same industrial instruments that the company has either negotiated or the Fair Work Commission has made. Um, so in, in terms of where the company itself is the employer, um, there is that the negotiation and discussion process that you talked around the company having with its employees um, where there's an EA should have occurred. Um, so certainly um, there should be um, clear um, processes within any enterprise agreement around um, how the various employees will be treated. 
um, and their, uh, what they're entitled to. I think in part you're referring to the combination of casuals and labour hire. I am, yeah, thank you for picking that up. Mm -hmm. um, so that, that and, does and make for a, a, a more complex situation. Recognising that um, you know, labour hire would regard as less than 2% of the workforce traditionally, um, but, it does, but it is an important mechanism um, that, is, that is used um, uh, by both hosts, well, by host employers for short-term work when they need it um, and when they're, as part of their, um, well, when the need arises. So recognising it, it's an important and valuable part of the economy. It does get, um, I, I think it's, it's, it's clear that when it leads to different rates of pay, it does cause some level of confusion. In, in terms of... Um, and, and beyond that, it causes some kind of angst as well, and it's, yeah. it's not very helpful I, for safety. I, I accept that, and, and I know that there's been a, a number of um, comments within the report itself uh, around that broad issue. The, um, it's certainly something that the department will look at very carefully. Um, it, is, it has been raised uh, both within the main body of the report um, as well as um, within your uh, comments uh, in terms of uh, how does that work. The reality is the Fair Work Act and the framework um, upon which it sits um, was designed around um, an employer being um, the, uh, the legal entity that actually employs the person rather than necessarily the location where they work. So that's the nature. And the Fair Work Act um, is clear that um, we have um, minimum rates of pay, but what we actually want to see is higher rates of pay than the minimum being negotiated um, by employers and employees. So that's, I think, one of the very clear principles within the bargaining provisions within the Fair Work Act, that we actually want to do that. The only mechanism that, um, and the mechanism is, is, is focused on um, the individual businesses. And, and, and in this case where you've got two businesses working, or the employees of two businesses working in the one location, um, I, I agree that um, can cause angst um, and confusion, but it's certainly something that we need to have a look at in response to the work, and that's, that's something that we'll provide advice to the government on um, once we've had the opportunity to finalise our analysis of the report. Um, but ha having said that, it, the, um, the very important focus within the Fair Work Act is, is that we do um, want people to bargain. We do want businesses and employees to get together and to think about how um, they can increase productivity and then share that productivity in the form of increased profits and in increased wages. So, uh, and the, the clearest mechanism to do that, we feel at this point, is um, on an individual business basis. Uh, thank you. You didn't. You, you gave us a comprehensive understanding of, and I know you've got that of the casual work situation and the abuse of that. And I'm certainly validating that some casuals want casual work. Mm -hmm. And I'm not just talking about the coal industry here, but even in the coal industry, some casuals do want casual work. They prefer to have that that option. Um, but there has been some abuse of that. And I believe that the complexities of the industrial relations system in this country right now <coughs> make it uh, such that some employers, rather than facing up to negotiation, um, they will bypass that and set up a, a labour hire, uh, establish a labour hire relationship. Some labour hire companies um, are good employers, some are not. And some rely upon basically cutting wages so that they can make a profit by getting the margin and still leaving the, the business owner with superior profits. So that's, that's definitely a strategy that we can see. So my, my question that I, that I don't feel was answered was that do you consider that the complexities, and, and the, the act is what, this high, 600 odd pages, the complexities of that act lead to workers, small businesses in particular, and even some big businesses not having clear understanding of the employer-employee relationship. And so we dive into all kinds of other arrangements. 
Um, Senator, the Fair Work Act is a substantial piece of legislation. It does have um, a number of parts. So, um, but um, we've certainly heard commentary in the past um, that it's complex and difficult. Um, and um, we acknowledge that commentary. At the same time, and um, we, we do understand the importance of this as well, um, there, are, there are important safety, um, uh, uh, worker safety, and, um, and, sorry, protections in terms of the bargaining process and other things, in terms of making sure that the bargaining is done fairly. Um, and, and certainly uh, there is um, some concern that those procedures inhibit the bargaining. But they're also really important in terms of the principle of making sure that the bargain is fair. So getting that balance right is something that we continue to think about. Um, we, uh, as a department, we, we honestly uh, are really engaged in the discussion around productivity growth. Uh, we think it's a significant issue for Australia and, and other uh, large parts of um, the Western world. Um, that, that productivity growth is low um, and we would certainly encourage parties to bargain. But the reality is that the, the Act is, is based on both um, the, um, providing the opportunity to bargain but also making sure that those bargains are fair. And, and I think that's sometimes where we see the complaints about complexity. Um, always happy to have a look and see how can we, how can we attain that fairness in a more simplified fashion, and, um, and that's where we. I think, and, and Senator Roberts, I mean, you often come with the Fair Work Act um, and the various iterations of it in terms of um, just to demonstrate how big it is and how much both employers and employees have to navigate because it's both parties understanding their their rights and obligations, um, and certainly, it, without a doubt, it is a complex act. And um, it was one of the reasons though, when you and I discussed this was last year now, I think. Um, just in relation to the reforms to casual employment, providing a definition to provide clarity as to what a casual is, offering the ability to convert to permanent work, um, clarifying the Rosato decision, the devastating $39 billion impact on the double dipping and what that would have done to business. So I, I do agree with you and we certainly have been able to make some headway uh, in relation to parts of it. Obviously, the other parts of the omnibus bill didn't get the support. But um, they are, I think, some concrete examples of where you can actually put in place. So, for example, an actual definition, give the ability to convert, clean up um, a court decision, um, and actually give certainty to employers. But I certainly acknowledge that this is something that you raise time and time again. Yeah, and, and the fundamental... Roberts, can I just uh, check how long we have to go? I usually like to rotate the call every 15 minutes. Another so two minutes? That's, that's absolutely okay. fine. What I'm getting at, Minister, is that the fundamental problem is that the, despite the intentions of everyone involved, the Fair Work Act, uh, the previous work choices attempt their mired in complexity, uh, lack of understanding of the fundamentals. And what's happening with the Fair Work Act is that the workers and some small businesses and even some large employers are sidelined in favour of the Industrial Relations Club. Lawyers, consultants, HR practitioners, uh, large union bosses, large industry groups, and the worker is sidelined. And so um, do you see any need then for restoring the primacy of the workplace relationship, the employer-employee relationship, um, making sure that there, and I know that the Fair Work Act, Mr. Hare, uh, does protect, does have protections in it, but when it's so complex, the protections get lost. And so making it clear on work, workers' rights, entitlements, protections, safety, which I, under, which I know assists productivity. So instead of these things being bypassed, they're actually entrenched. Um, and allowing for flexibility, because more and more workers today see alternative structures of work and work times in particular, whether it be uni students or small businesses or casual coal miners, they want that. And I think you make an important point in terms of the ability for, in particular, employees to choose the type of yes. work that they want to undertake, and that is why you'll never find the coalition government in any way demonising uh, casual employment, as so often happens, and in particular in this committee. Um, it is a valid form of work that so many choose, and when we can take you through 
um, the statistics in relation to casual employment, but also that landmark reform that we did pass in terms of that ability to actually convert, should you wish, subject to certain conditions. Again, it's about giving both the employer and the worker, the employee, the choice um, to do that. J just in terms of, though, people actually understanding their rights, very important, obligations, very important under the Fair Work Act. I think a lot of the work that the Fair Work Ombudsman does, and in particular that investment in its educative role is so important, working with small businesses, because it's often the small businesses that don't have that capacity mm. to understand the Fair Work Act. Um, and I know, and they'll be on later on today, if, if you want to come back and ask them questions in terms of what is the educative role of the Fair Work Ombudsman? Um, we asked that at the last estimates. We can get an update then at this estimate. <laughs> <laughs> but but you know, that's a really good point because it's not just about the Fair Work Act itself, as you've acknowledged. There are other ways and means, and one of them is ensuring that the Fair Work Ombudsman um, is able to get out there, talk to employees, talk to employers, and actually educate them on what their rights and responsibilities are. I, I know that... Um uh, I've had a very positive response and, and in fact, uh, agreement that, yep. that David Noonan from the uh, CFMEU, yes. Michael Ravbar from the Queensland, from yes. the CFMEU and from Queensland, from the Business Council of yep. Australia, from small business associations, that they'd be willing to sit down in a process to explore a much simpler and better and more effective um, industrial relations framework. So I know an election is coming, so I'm not expecting you to make any commitment and this is a touchy area. but. Is there any appetite for that if it's done properly? Oh, well, I think when you look at the work that the coalition government has done, you look at the omnibus bill that we brought forward, I mean, that was certainly done um, in a, a, a period of um, over 12 months, I believe, uh, in terms of the consultations amongst different stakeholders. Unfortunately, when we brought it to the floor of the parliament, um, it, it wasn't supported by the, the Australian Labor Party. Um, but I think our appetite for making things simpler, um, and in particular, as I said, the coalition reforms to casual employment, and in particular, cleaning up the issue of double dipping and the potential devastating impact of the $39 billion impost on business, I think does show a genuine commitment to working with all stakeholders uh, to improve the system. Um, with due respect, I just want to finish with this point. I think that that casual's conversion was needed and essential. It's a shame it was bogged down in so much uh, misrepresentations by a lot of people, but quite frankly, I think that was tinkering um, and not not reform. It was it was reform of casuals, but not reform of industrial relations. Understood. Thank you, Chair. Uh, oh, I don't miss oh, okay. one. Can I just add one thing? Is it, is it the, as a, uh, the Minister indicated, the, the casual uh, amendments, the bill, uh, that does introduce uh, the national employment standards, yep. casual conversion at national employment standards, and does simplify the systems? Uh, um, a bit prior to that uh, introduction into the NAS, you got a different uh, conversions uh, uh, in the awards, in the uh, enterprise agreement. In the particularly black coal mining industries, there are confusion about whether the peoples are eligible for conversion or not. Uh, there are people who uh, may not have a conversion. There was a gap. So uh, by introducing it into the Fair Work Act as a national employment standards, that provides a universal right to all the employees yep. and in certain ways also yep. simplified assistance. And I, and I accept that and appreciate what you said, uh, Ms Yang. The fact that the Black Coal Mine Award prevented excluded casuals, yet there were still casuals under various types of enterprise agreements which were not, um, I don't believe they complied with the law, indicates that the industrial relations system is a mess. But we, that's why we supported the introduction of casual conversion, uh, because it does clarify things for people. Yes. But there's a long, long way to go to fix this mess. Yes, uh, and uh, the casual conversion does now apply to the people who's covered by the Black Coal Mining yep. uh, Award. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Senator Roberts. So 